On August 22, another crisis erupted on Atago Hill in Tokyo. A group of right-wing students, determined to resist the surrender, had been positioned in a building on top of the hill for several days. They had assembled an arsenal of ammunition and grenades. Already nervous over the pending Allied occupation, the police had quickly tried to quell the disturbance. On August 20, Kempe Tai Colonel Makoto Tsukamoto walked up the slope to reason with the students. His pleas were ignored. Other police officials went to the top of Otago but were unable to disband the group. On August 22, armed men surrounded the rebels. A call went out to Yoshio Kodama, entrusted by the government with the handling of such incidents around the capital. Through driving rain, Kodama went to the scene in the afternoon. Both in the building and on the drenched slopes below, there were enough guns in possession of rebels and militia to start the war all over again. Kodama rushed to talk to the leader of the student group and discovered he was a long-time friend, Yoshio Ijima. Ijima explained that the rebels believed the emperor to have been forced by his advisers to surrender. When Kodama told him that he was wrong, Ijima was crushed. He and his friends broke down and cried. When he recovered, he asked, Can we stay here at least till morning? Then we'll leave and cause no further trouble. Kodama promised to check with the police and left the building. A steady rain had now changed to a torrential downpour. At the bottom of the hill, Kodama talked with the chief of police, who told him he could not take the responsibility for allowing the insurgents to stay longer than six o'clock that night. He had already issued them an ultimatum, he told Kodama, ordering them off the hill. If the insurgents refused to withdraw, he would have to follow his orders and send his own troops up after them. Then he added, if you get permission from headquarters, I'll be happy to go along with their wishes. Kodama ran back to the unhappy group at the top and outlined the problem. Ijima explained his reason for staying until morning. We wanted to choose some men to die for their responsibility in this affair. The pitiful group had decided to punish itself for its own indiscretion. Kodama begged them to delay their decision until he got back. Once more he ran down the hill in the driving rain, and once more he talked with the chief of police, who shouted over the fury of the storm, I want to avoid any unnecessary sacrifices. I hope your efforts will succeed. Hurry back. Kodama raced off in a car to Metropolitan Police Headquarters to get an extension on the six o'clock deadline, now only thirty minutes away. At three minutes to six, he returned armed with the power to negotiate with the rebels. As he got out of his car and looked up through the rain, he heard the reports of pistols being fired. They were followed almost instantly by an awesome series of shattering explosions which turned the top of Otago into a spreading column of black smoke. Kodama ran up the slope along with the police. When the police prematurely fired, the young men had linked themselves into a chain and pulled pins from grenades. They lay sprawled on the ground, their entrails spilling out, their blood carpeting the grass. The leader, Ijima, his arm blown off, lay with his lungs shredded and exposed. Weeping from shock, Kodama knelt down beside him and washed his face with rainwater as police began to collect the pieces of bodies that littered the grass of Otago. From the Japanese Imperial GHQ to the Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers Radiogram, Num 19, August 22, in spite of our utmost efforts to avoid calamities of war, the situation in China has not been improved and the activities of irregular force are causing serious difficulties in the cessation of hostilities. Both in Japan and on the fringes of the empire, trouble continued to plague the attempts at orderly surrender. On the evening of the 23rd of August, another important meeting was held in Tokyo. The time had come to choose a man to meet the first Americans to land in Japan, and Japanese officials were anxious to select the proper delegate for this most delicate assignment. Upon this initial confrontation on the soil of Honshu itself might rest the character of the entire occupation. In the heavy downpour which again drenched Tokyo that day, one man drove to the conference hopeful of being chosen for the job. Lieutenant General Seizo Arisue, the ambitious chief of intelligence for the Imperial Army, knew that his countrymen had to choose a high-ranking officer for this extraordinary post. Supremely confident of his own abilities, he believed that his experiences with ranking American officers before the war would stand him in good stead when the first Americans arrived and occupation began, but he had no doubt that his nomination would be challenged. 
He had many enemies among foreign office personnel, and they would probably try to prevent his selection. Arisue, a bantam-sized figure, enjoyed the prospect of a fight. A huge cigar clenched in his teeth, he got out of his limousine and walked into the midst of his enemies. His surmise had been correct. The foreign office spokesman quickly revealed their hostility. Harsh words filled the air when his name was brought up for consideration. He was called a fascist, a friend of Mussolini, and therefore eminently unsuited for the sensitive chore of greeting MacArthur. Premier Higashi Kuni was particularly outspoken in supporting this objection to him. Arisue hastened to take up the fight. He could not deny that he and Mussolini had indeed become close during the period he had spent in Europe as part of his training. However, Arisue argued, just because he admired the Italian leader, it did not necessarily follow that he was a fascist at heart. The argument dragged on for some time, with Arisue striking back at his detractors. Perhaps because of his defiant stand, perhaps because there was nothing more positive against him than guilt by association, Supporters rallied to his side at a late hour, and General Arisue won out over the faction at the Foreign Office. He was instructed to go to Atsugi Air Base the next day, August 24, to prepare for the arrival of the Americans within 48 hours. When the cocky, bemedalled officer left the building and walked through the still pelting rain, he was both elated at his personal victory and appalled at the monumental challenge before him. Atsugi was a cauldron of intrigue, caused by dissident elements. It was also a badly damaged airstrip, in pitiable condition to receive the conquerors. Arisue went to bed, wondering whether he could, in fact, cope with the responsibilities he had fought to assume. At twelve o'clock the next day, he had further reason to doubt. Before leaving the meeting the night before, he had requested seventy men to be present at the noon hour to go with him to the airfield. Just ten arrived at the appointed time. General Arisue led a small caravan of cars down the dusty road to Atsugi, past long columns of Japanese soldiers going the other way. Fully armed, they had been ordered to quit the area to avoid conflict with the approaching Americans. Tanks, artillery pieces and men moved steadily to the north and east as the small procession of black cars headed southwest to Atsugi and a rendezvous with the invader. To Arisue the spectacle was unreal. His Japanese army was leaving the field without having engaged the enemy. Unbeaten units were retreating from the beaches and defences to which they had been assigned. Only the black limousines were travelling in the direction of the pending confrontation. Somewhere to the south, the enemy of recent years and days was preparing to fly into an airfield in strength and take control of his country. Seizo Arisue smoked his cigar in silence as he neared the airport. When he arrived, he saw that the base was a shambles. Hangars had been blasted apart by American bombs. Runways were pitted from frequent attacks. Not one of the bullet-ridden planes littering the field had a propeller. Less than 24 hours before Arisue's arrival, soldiers sent by Imperial General Headquarters had arrived from Tokyo to dismantle the engines and prevent any kamikazes from making last flights against the enemy. This action had precipitated a vicious battle between the Navy personnel based there and the Army visitors. With fists, pistols and pieces of furniture, they had fought for the right to control Atsugi. Rooms in the barracks had been demolished, and walls and chairs were smeared with blood, but now the kamikazes were gone. Arisue went to work. During the evening of the same day, the exhausted general was sitting near an open window going over the status of the work details. Suddenly a loud commotion sounded outside the barracks building. He poked his head out and yelled, What the hell is going on? There, in the moonlight, two soldiers were engaged in a deadly duel with swords. They had reached an impasse over the fact of surrender, and had decided to settle the issue by fighting to the death outside General Arisue's window. Their battleground was badly chosen. With the awesome responsibility of greeting the Americans before him, Arisue had no time for personal grievances. He roared through the stillness at the two combatants, who were so startled that they dropped their swords and slunk away in the darkness. General Arisue returned to his desk and a bottle of beer. Back in Tokyo, General Seiichi Tanaka was sipping Kalpis, his favourite soft drink, with his aide in a room next to his office in the Daiichi building. He had spent the last 24 hours completing paperwork. During the afternoon, his second son Toshimoto had come to visit him, 
and the general had sent him away brusquely, saying, Don't disturb me tonight. I'll be busy with a guest. The day before, Tanaka had been at home for a few quiet hours with his wife and the rest of his family. He played with his grandchildren and read poems in his bedroom. When he said his goodbyes and left the house under an umbrella, his wife handed his aide a revolver, whispering, Please give this to him. A proud man, Tanaka had been bothered for months by the deterioration in Japan's situation. He was a sensitive intellectual, more apt than most to suffer inner conflict over such a calamity. The general's background was unlike that of most military leaders in Japan. For three years he had attended Oxford University, where he had studied the works of Shakespeare. For one year, 1930, he had served as military attaché at the Japanese embassy in Mexico City. In both places, he was exposed to the more liberal philosophies of Western society. Yet in the last days of the war, Seiichi Tanaka's oriental heritage, rather than his Western education, dominated his thinking. When he assumed the command of the Eastern Army Group, he was entrusted with the defence of the Tokyo district. Yet he had watched helplessly as American planes flattened a different section of the capital on each raid. The raid of May 25, which partially destroyed the Emperor's palace, had plunged him into complete despair. As sworn protector of Hirohito, Tanaka had wanted to atone for the misfortune by killing himself. Only the personal intervention of the Emperor had dissuaded him. Unable to forget the enormity of the crime against the throne, Tanaka continued to brood through the summer months. The attempted coup in the palace on the day of surrender was the final blow. He was shocked and hurt at the audacity of the young officers who besieged the imperial enclave and killed others to thwart the expressed wishes of the government. Though he succeeded in dispersing the rebels, he humbly apologised to the emperor. Hirohito saw his agitation and expressed both appreciation for the general's actions and hopes that Tanaka would continue to work for the nation. Tanaka had done so. After the 15th, he continued with the demobilization of his troops and was instrumental in resolving a number of anti-surrender outbreaks in the capital. Now the Americans were about to land in his own area of supervision, the ultimate insult to his honor. His last public statement was made to a rebellious student group at Kawaguchi. I am telling you as the commander of the Eastern District of Japan that Japan was defeated. We must demobilize. I know what is going on in your hearts, but we must all think of His Majesty. You men all have bright futures. It is you who must lead Japan from now on. Begin again. The atom bomb has changed the state of war completely. It is the will of God that we abandon the long history of the Japanese army. New generations will come. Please make an effort to construct a new nation. The young men before him and the general himself were crying when he finished. Now, on the evening of August 24, he sat talking with his aide. The calpis he loved was followed by tea. As he finished it, he said fondly to the junior officer, You have devoted your life to me. Then rose abruptly and went into the next room. His aide sat alone for about ten minutes, his eyes filled with tears. Then a soldier came to him and told him Tanaka wished to see him. When the aide came to the doorway of the general's office, he saw Tanaka sitting in an armchair in full dress uniform. The two men stared at each other for an instant. Then Tanaka pulled the trigger of his pistol and tore his chest apart. Carefully arranged on the desk beside him were his last bequests and mementos. There were six letters, his military cap, a pair of white gloves and a gorgeous sword presented to him by the Emperor. Behind these stood a small statue of the Emperor Meiji, a cigarette case, two sacred books on Buddhism, an eyeglass case with eyeglasses and a set of false teeth. The General's last message to his family was simple. All of us devoted ourselves to His Majesty as military men, but now I feel terrible that Japan has been defeated. I am going to die, but I do not regret it at all. I cannot help but wish for the prosperity and health of our family. Mourners came to the office in the next hours. Mrs. Tanaka arrived and was impressively stoical in her acceptance of the death of her husband. As she helped to change his uniform, badly stained with blood, a tall, bald-headed man stood to one side watching. General Gen Sugiyama, commander of the First Army, listened thoughtfully as Tanaka's aide explained his reasons for committing suicide. Since Sugiyama himself was undergoing a painful examination of his own philosophy in these emotional days after surrender, Tanaka's action came at a most crucial moment in his tortured thinking.
Shortly thereafter, the mustachioed field marshal paid his condolences to Mrs. Tanaka and left. Behind him, the relatives and servants of Seichi Tanaka placed his body in a wooden coffin. Several hundred miles to the southwest of Reini Atsugi, another man was wondering exactly what conditions there were. He was particularly concerned because he was to be the first American soldier to set foot on Japan. He did not expect to live through the experience. Charlie Tench, a colonel and West Point graduate, never thought of himself as a hero. As a member of MacArthur's staff in Manila, he had spent most of the war planning details of various invasions. When the atomic bomb fell, Tench found himself temporarily out of a job. On the afternoon of August 19, he was sitting in his room reading old magazines when he received an unexpected summons to the office of General Stephen Chamberlain. The general laid before him a challenging assignment. Somebody had to lead a party of men into Japan before the main force landed. Communications had to be set up. The runways at Atsugi made serviceable, and order established at the airfield. The general outlined the negotiations currently in progress with the Kawabe delegation in Manila, then asked, How would you like to command the advance group into Japan? Tench was flattered, though a bit staggered at the thought of being the first one into enemy territory. He recovered quickly, however, and said, I wouldn't miss it for the world. When the Kawabe delegation left, final plans were made for Tench's invasion. He and his men would go to Okinawa on the 25th and leave for Japan at midnight that same day. The intervening period would be utilised by the Japanese to quell any disturbances by the kamikazes. Tench was not very happy about the fact that rebels still roamed through Japan. At the colonel's mess in Manila, he endured the heavy humour of fellow officers who kept a betting pool on his chances for survival. Opinion was divided equally. 50% thought his plane would be blown from the sky as it approached Atsugi. The others were sure that he would be murdered as he stepped from the plane. Tench was not amused. He was aware that General Kawabe had been worried about the unrest in his own country, and that he had implored the Americans to hold off occupation for at least ten days. On the 25th, the advance party emplaned for Okinawa. It was buffeted by a typhoon, gaining strength in the area, and it did not reach 5th Air Force headquarters until noon of that day. Tench went to the headquarters of General Whitehead and participated in a thorough briefing on the mission. Though no one openly suggested that the Japanese around Tokyo might resist the landing, everyone recognised that possibility. Tench was on edge but kept his thoughts to himself. As the afternoon progressed, the typhoon's fury increased. The rains became a deluge, and the area around Atsugi in Japan lay in the middle of the storm. While the Japanese laboured desperately to make the airfield ready, the Americans debated the wisdom of sending Tench out into the bad weather. In the evening, the answer came from Manila. A 48-hour postponement was ordered. The Japanese had two more days to bring sanity to the airstrip, to control the unmanageable elements, to repair the damage to the base. Everyone in Japan, and particularly Colonel Charles Tench on Okinawa, breathed deeply in relief. Japan was growing tense with fear. In Gifu City, the mayor ordered all girls aged 15 to 25 to go into the mountains to avoid American soldiers. Women workers at the Nakajima Aircraft Company plant in Utsunomiya asked the factory manager for poison to swallow in case American soldiers tried to rape them. They were given cyanide capsules. At the Kanto Kyogo Company, similar capsules were distributed to 1,000 women workers in order to help them maintain their honour as Japanese ladies in case of attack. In Tokyo itself, newspapers published a series of articles advising the people how to act toward the advancing Americans. Women were warned to wear loose-fitting clothes in order to appear less attractive to soldiers. In case they were attacked, they must maintain their dignity while crying loudly for help. Fathers and husbands were cautioned to remove their females to the countryside until the occupation was well underway. It was repeatedly stressed that women should not smile at strangers as they often did, because Americans might misconstrue the basic Japanese friendliness as an invitation of another sort. Above all, the citizens of Japan were reminded of the country's proud spirit which would lead them to a better life in the coming years. The government was attempting to shore up the confidence of the people, to restore some semblance of self-respect to the nation. From the Japanese Imperial GHQ to the Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers Radiogram No. 13, 
Some officers and men of the Allied powers without giving a previous notice came Rai airplane to some places under Japanese control for the purpose of making contact with or giving comfort to prisoners of war or civilian internees. We earnestly request you to prevent the recurrence of such incidents. The Japanese were complaining about the mercy teams sent from Gus Krause's base at Ishian to various prison camps. They were afraid that such missions would cause bloodshed between Americans and still armed Japanese troops. So far, all of the parachute units dropped behind enemy lines had come through the ordeal unscathed, without suffering any killed or wounded. The fears of the officials at Chungking and Kunming had not materialized. At Mukden, Hennessy's team survived an initial fright and effected a complete success. At Weixian, parachutists found their biggest problem the civilian internees. Overjoyed at the sight of healthy-looking Americans, some of the women proved almost unmanageable in their affection. At Keijo, Korea, the American team was greeted by a Japanese officer, who begged them to go home before any trouble erupted. He offered them gasoline, then put them under protective custody. The next day, the Americans returned to base without getting to the nearby prisoner of war camp. The commanding officer of the parachute team was promptly relieved of his duties by angered American superiors. At Peking, a team under Major Roy Nichols jumped in to find the Japanese-held city already pacified by Jim Kellis and his small band. While tending to the needs of prisoners of war in the area, Nichols's group, codenamed Operation Magpie, solved a mystery that had disturbed American officials for over three years. Guided by a released internee, Hector Duberrier, the team overcame Japanese efforts at concealment and found the last survivors of two American bomber crews missing since 1942. In April of that year, a group of B-25s under General Jimmy Doolittle had been sent from the carrier Hornet to bomb Japan. On returning from the mission, eight airmen crash-landed in China and were trapped by the Japanese. Tried for indiscriminate attacks on civilians, the Americans were sentenced to death. Three were actually executed. On October 15, 1942, Lieutenant Dean Hallmark, Lieutenant William Farrow and Sergeant Harold Spatz were led out to a cemetery in Shanghai. They knew they were about to die. The day before, they had written last letters home. Farrow told his mother, Read Thanatopsis by Brian if you want to know how I am taking this. My faith in God is complete, so I am unafraid. Spatz told his father that he loved him. Hallmark could not really believe he was going to be dead soon. At the cemetery, the flyers were made to kneel before three wooden crosses to which their arms were tied. White cloths were wrapped around their foreheads. Black dots in the middle of each cloth marked the aiming point for the firing squad. The Americans died in a volley of rifle fire. After the execution, Japanese soldiers placed the bodies in caskets and saluted the fallen warriors. The sentences of the remaining crewmen were commuted to life imprisonment, Lieutenant Robert Meda lingered for over a year before dying of malnutrition, beriberi and medical neglect. Of the surviving four, Sergeant James de Chazal became increasingly weak and was subject to visions. Lieutenants Robert Height and Chase Nielsen remained in relatively fair condition, compared to George Barr, who was almost dead when he was rescued. Barr was hospitalised in China for months. The other three started for home immediately. Elsewhere, the world was pleased by the announcement on August 24 of a peace pact. Chiang Kai-shek and Joseph Stalin, through their representatives T.V. Sung and V.M. Molotov, had agreed on a joint policy in the Far East, especially in the area of North China and Manchuria. Russia professed special interest in Port Arthur and Darren, warm water ports on the Yellow Sea. China professed equal interest in Manchuria itself. Many points were thrashed out in the nine-part pact, but one in particular stood out. The Russians agreed to render to China moral support and aid in military supplies and other material resources, such support and aid to be given entirely to the nationalist government and the central government of China. Regarding the declaration, the New York Times reflected general feeling in the United States when it observed, The clouds of civil war that have darkened China's horizon are already beginning to recede. Some interested parties did not think so. State Department officials in Washington were not sure that Stalin had guaranteed China anything. Others, like Ambassador Avril Harriman in Moscow, were disturbed to realize that since Soviet armies were already in control of Manchuria, Russian adherence to any agreement was strictly at the whim of the Kremlin. 
Worried Americans could only hope that Stalin meant to keep his word and to maintain, among other things, an open-door policy in China. It was a forlorn hope. Russia had already formulated a far-reaching scheme for the entire Far East. In July, a Japanese espionage agent had gained access to a Soviet committee report prepared especially for the pending Potsdam Conference. This ambitious policy paper outlined both a long-range strategy and short-term tactics. Ultimately, it called for, one, the union of Japanese leftists with disaffected army and navy officers after the war, in order to thwart the growth of an American democracy in Japan. Two, combination of Japanese industry with Chinese agriculture in a Sino-Japanese leftists union, which would eventually control the propertied classes in both countries. Three, the organization of both Korea and Formosa into communist states. For the immediate future, it suggested support for the agrarian class in northwest China and envisioned this group as an anchor of strength for the Russians in the Far East. The Soviets acted on this last objective in August of 1945. From the Japanese GHQ to the Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers, August 24, 1945, in certain localities, disarmed Japanese forces and civilians are being made victims of illegitimate firing, looting, acts of violence, rape and other outrages. The situation is certain to get out of control. On the Asian mainland, the communists had just begun to fight. Soviet forces were swarming over the countryside, plundering like the Mongol hordes of the 12th century. Already they had lanced through weakened Japanese fortifications along the Manchurian and Korean borders and were headed directly for the populous plains around Mukden and Port Arthur. Acting in concert with them, the long-besieged troops of Mao Zedong infiltrated from the caves of Yan'an toward the big cities of North China in quest of guns and ammunition for the final battle to defeat Chiang Kai-shek. At Kalgan, near the Manchurian border, Russian soldiers captured a huge ammunition dump and turned it over to communist guerrillas, an action specifically prohibited at the Yalta Conference. Stalin was beginning to break his agreements with the Chiang Kai-shek government, with America, with all his wartime allies. In North Korea, political officers of the Soviet army agitated in the streets, exhorting the Korean civilians to expropriate all Japanese property. An executive committee of the Korean people was quickly formed as the Reds moved to set up a base for subversion of the masses. The discernible pattern was a familiar one. Russia had begun to seduce its newly won territories. Slowly, a curtain of steel was being established around Stalin's Far Eastern gains. In North China, American OSS units in the field were virtually surrounded by militant Chinese Reds. Major Gus Krause's prophecy of a new war was tragically accurate. In the countryside around the big cities, the communists daily grew bolder. They blocked entrance to towns. They engaged in skirmishes with nationalist and Japanese forces. They also killed their first American. John M. Birch was a captain in the Air Force and a special agent attached to the OSS. From the main base at Xi'an in North China, Birch operated in forays behind the Japanese lines. Fellow officers knew him as a quiet, unassuming person, devoid of any personality traits which would make him stand out in a crowd. Later, in fact, some at Xi'an were hard-pressed to recall anything at all unusual about him. When Emperor Hirohito broadcast the news of surrender to the Japanese people, Captain Birch was at Lingchuan in Anhui province, positioned there to take advantage of any precipitate enemy collapse. Within days, Birch received instructions from Xi'an to proceed toward the city of Suzhou in an attempt to ascertain Chinese communist intentions in the area. The OSS was concerned about the growing menace from the Reds and had ordered several teams to reconnoiter their territories for further information to be passed on to Washington. Birch headed toward the danger zone at the head of a mixed band of American, Chinese and Korean agents. The boyish-looking captain with the protruding ears was exceedingly well qualified for his job. The son of a Baptist missionary, he had spent much of his life among the Chinese people. He was amazingly fluent in the varied dialects of the countryside and had also acquired a profound understanding of the Chinese. He was deeply disturbed by the rising power of the communist army among the peasants and firmly convinced that the Reds posed a tremendous threat to the future of the country. Now at noon of August 24, Captain Birch embarked on a supposedly routine journey to Suzhou. The trip was not easy. The unit went on foot, by boat and by train. 
Communists were in evidence on all sides. In the vacuum left by the retreating Japanese, they had come out into the open to assume control of key points. Entire sections of railroads were being systematically ripped up by red guerrillas, who occupied much of the rural landscape. Birch became increasingly dismayed. As the OSS team neared Suchow, Birch and the others were forced to proceed by foot due to increasing interference with rail travel. On August 25, he and his party had advanced to within 30 miles of their objective. At a rail depot, they ran right into a communist roadblock, set up to prevent access to the Japanese-held city. Birch was furious. Already disturbed by the harassment imposed by the Reds during the arduous journey, he was incensed at this latest incident. He ordered his aide, a nationalist officer named Tung, to find the communist commander in charge and request permission to proceed into Suchou. Tung found the man and repeated Birch's instructions. The officer listened for a moment, then turned to an aide and said, Here come some more spies. He added that the Birch team should be disarmed. Birch's aide was horrified at this prospect and rushed back to the American captain to warn him. Birch immediately confronted the Chinese commander who had voiced the threat. So you intend to disarm us? Are you bandits? Are you the man responsible for this situation? When the officer said that he was not, Birch insisted that he be taken directly to the Chinese officer's superior. He told Tung, I must find out who these soldiers belong to and who the commanding officer is. Fearful of the consequences, others in the Birch party cautioned him to be more subtle in dealing with the belligerent communists who now escorted him along the rail line. One of the nationalist officers in the OSS team whispered to Tung, Tell the captain to be more polite to this group. Although Tung repeated the urgent message, Birch refused to change his attitude. He was disgusted with the hostile guerrillas and determined to have a showdown. He spoke to Tung as they marched along. I want to find out how they intend to treat Americans. I don't mind if they kill me, for if they do, their movement will be finished. The United States will use the atomic bomb to stop their banditry. The communists led the OSS team from one position to another, looking for the one officer Birch had requested permission to address. The American captain's temper was growing shorter by the minute as he was forced to walk around and around in the custody of the Red Guerrillas. Finally, he exploded. Seizing the nearest officer by the collar, he shouted, You're worse than bandits! His aide, Tung, said quickly to the officer, He is only joking! In this tense atmosphere, a senior communist officer appeared from a building, and stood watching the two men shouting at each other. Suddenly he shouted, Load your guns and disarm him. His finger pointed directly at Captain Birch. Tong saw that Birch was in no mood to be coerced and pleaded, Wait a minute, I'll get his gun for you. The communist officer in charge looked at him coldly and said to his men, Shoot him first. A gorilla cocked his gun and fired into Tong's right leg near the hip. As he fell to the ground, another soldier fired at John Birch. Tung heard a man say, bring him along. Apparently in reference to Birch, who was lying in agony in the dust. Before Tung lapsed into unconsciousness, he heard Birch cry, I can't walk. The communists dragged the OSS captain to another spot, where his hands were bound behind his back. He was then prodded into a kneeling position before his captors. A communist officer stepped behind him, placed a pistol to his head, and blasted a hole in his skull. The body sagged face down, blood spreading quickly from it. Then, perhaps to hinder identification, Birch's face was repeatedly slashed with bayonets. Several days later, other OSS agents found him, his hands still tied behind his back, his GI fatigues caked with blood. He lay in the dirt, his face a festering mass without any recognisable features. The body was photographed, wrapped in a white shroud and placed in a pine box. Taken to Suchow, Birch's original destination, it was buried on the side of a hill overlooking the city. His murderers had long since vanished into the countryside. The details of John Birch's death were brought back to OSS headquarters. Pictures of his mutilated body were displayed to shocked American officials, who could do nothing more than relay this latest symptom of communist hostility and aggressiveness to Washington. They hoped that such evidence of red tactics in China might alert the United States government to take a more positive stance in the crucial weeks ahead. In Manchuria, General Jonathan Wainwright was still missing. 
In Washington and Chongqing, alarmed officials continued to worry about his fate, and his rescue had assumed paramount importance. In the eyes of the American public, Wainwright was a martyred hero of the dark days of 1942. He symbolised the men who had paid the price for American unpreparedness before Pearl Harbour. Wainwright was a professional soldier, a prototype of the men who led the American army during the tedium of peace before World War II. His family had a military heritage dating back before the Civil War. His grandfather had been a member of the first class to graduate from the Naval Academy in the 1840s. Killed at Galveston Bay in 1863, he had initiated a family tradition of duty to country. Wainwright's uncle had been killed in 1871 in a gun battle with a pirate ship off the coast of Mexico. In that same year, his father had entered West Point. In 1906, Jonathan himself graduated from the academy and embarked on a career which included 34 long years of relatively uneventful service. He did fight against the Moros in the Philippines, and he served as a staff officer in World War I. But mostly he trained the small peacetime army. In 1938, he was made Brigadier General. In 1940, Wainwright received his most challenging assignment when he was sent to Manila to command the Philippines Division, then being formed under a stepped-up programme. There, General Douglas MacArthur directed the overall defence of the islands. Retired from the American Army in 1937, the famous soldier had gone to the Philippines at the request of that nation to help build up its fighting strength. Neither MacArthur nor men like Wainwright could work a miracle in the brief time allotted. Though the Filipinos were given some semblance of training in the period of grace before Pearl Harbor, it was not enough. Equipment was practically non-existent. Air power was negligible. Ground troops had only a rudimentary knowledge of field strategy and tactics. On the morning of December 8, 1941, December 7, Hawaii time, General Wainwright rose in his darkened bedroom to answer the insistent phone. He learned that Pearl Harbor was devastated. At this point, the general, in his 36th year of service, embarked upon the climactic assignment of his career, and perhaps the most cruel duty an American general endured during the entire war. The Japanese struck boldly at the Philippines. On the first day, they destroyed almost every bomber and fighter plane the United States had in the Far East. Within a week, they invaded Luzon at several points and engaged the American and Filipino divisions in the first major land battle of the Pacific War. Wainwright fought a hopeless fight. Outnumbered, outgunned, his inexperienced men died on the trails in front of the onrushing enemy. By December 23, just 15 days after hostilities began, MacArthur saw that only one manoeuvre was left. He initiated War Plan Orange III, the long-agreed-upon strategy of withdrawal to the Bataan Peninsula on the northern side of Manila Bay. Here, the Americans would stand and make a final effort. Wainwright was ordered to take his troops into this jungle fortress and assume predetermined positions. As commander of the northern Luzon troops, Wainwright held the Japanese at bay while other elements from southern Luzon moved up to and around Manila into the temporary sanctuary of Bataan. For over three months, these men denied control of the peninsula to the Japanese. For over three months, the thousands trapped on the steaming battleground managed to live and challenge the enemy. During that time, MacArthur was ordered to Australia by President Roosevelt, and Wainwright assumed supreme command of all forces in the Philippines. Rarely has a man been given a more onerous responsibility. War Plan Orange envisaged a six months defence of the islands until help came from the United States. The forces on Bataan were holding fairly well to that concept. The only flaw was the lack of reinforcements from America. No armada was on its way. No fleet or concentration of air power was being readied at Pearl Harbor to bring relief to the beleaguered men on Bataan. They were isolated, without hope. The soldiers had eaten the last horse and most were starving to death. Malaria had sapped their strength. Ammunition was very low. On April 9th, guns stopped firing and an ominous silence came over the bay. On Corregidor, the island fortress at the entrance to the harbour, Wainwright looked across at the peninsula of Bataan and felt desperately alone. The Japanese concentrated on Corregidor with ferocious intensity. Large calibre shells rained on the rock where men trembled in tunnels. Over a thousand wounded lay helpless in the hospital deep inside the cavernous fortifications. On the 5th of May, the Japanese landed on Corregidor, 
and moved toward the main headquarters. Wainwright had to make a dreadful decision, to sacrifice the remaining survivors in a suicidal resistance or to surrender in order to keep his men alive. At 10.30 a.m. on May 6th, the radio station on Corregidor came alive. Message for General Homer. Message for General Homer. A white flag went to the top of a pole at noon, and the Philippines' command of General Jonathan Wainwright ceased to exist. Wainwright went into captivity. When he heard the details of the Bataan death march, he wondered if he was to blame for the horrible aftermath to surrender. Would it have been better to have ordered a fight to the last? He became a tortured man. For over three years, his conscience nagged him. Wanting rescue badly, he nevertheless feared its consequences. By the summer of 1945, Wainwright resembled a skeleton navigating under its own power. He weighed less than 130 pounds. The skin on his face was tightly drawn, and his clothes hung grotesquely on his six-foot, three-inch frame. His spirit had been sapped by the harsh treatment received in various Japanese camps, yet he had struggled manfully to stay alive until the Day of Freedom. The general was confined at Sion, a small way stop northeast of Mukden. Only 35 other prisoners were with him. Half of them were allied general officers or high officials, such as the governor of Singapore and General Percival, the defender of that bastion when it fell in 1942. They had come to this remote land only the previous fall from Formosa, where the bulk of the Bataan captives had been kept for over two years. During that time, many men had died and others had become living corpses. The enemy had been callous, calculatedly inhuman and vindictive. The worst treatment came from the Japanese privates and corporals, the beatings, the occasional punches in the face, the hours at attention in the freezing cold. Wainwright himself had been beaten badly on several occasions. What hurt him more, however, were the less direct torments. When Red Cross packages arrived at the camps, the men would delight at the thought of food, yet the packages seldom were distributed to the prisoners. Their hopes for this little extra supply of nourishment would rise and fall quickly as the commandants managed to lose the packages or pass them out to their own soldiers. For over three years, Jonathan Wainwright managed to survive this life. He amused himself as best he could. He read Northwest Passage and Oliver Wiswell over and over till he could recite them almost word for word. He played solitaire by the hour and kept track of the times he won. He was the official sharpener of razors for the Allied personnel in the camp. Though he picked up bits of information about the war by various means, he had no inkling that the Americans were even as close as Okinawa. He saw no planes, heard no bombings. For him, the war was still far enough away to make the future seem especially grim. Having barely survived the unbelievable cold of the Manchurian winter, he was despondent about his own life. He had nearly frozen to death in the barracks. Temperatures of 45 degrees below zero made the meagre stove heat almost useless. Though he slept in all the clothing he could find, he shivered through the long, bitter nights and into a spring that was filled with a bleak sameness. The food was tasteless and barely palatable. There was cornmeal mush at breakfast, a thin gruel for lunch, and vegetables and soya curd for supper. Day in and day out, the monotonous, barren existence preyed on Wainwright and the others. On August 16, after exactly 1,200 days in captivity, General Wainwright was sitting in his room playing solitaire, game number 8,632. Corporal Willard, an orderly, knocked on the door, stuck his head in and smiled. I congratulate you, General. Really? For what? The war is over. Wainwright's mind reeled. I don't believe it. Who told you? Willard told him that a Japanese interpreter at the camp had just explained that the Russians had invaded Manchuria and Japan had sued for peace. Dazed, Wainwright said, Was he drunk or sober? Willard answered, Well, he'd had some sake. Though not completely convinced, Wainwright could not sleep all night. In the morning, the Japanese commandant, Lieutenant Marui, confirmed the prisoner's wild speculations. They were lined up in formation and told, By order of the Emperor, the war has been amicably terminated. The phrasing of the speech struck the small group the same way at the same instant. They broke out into a spontaneous burst of laughter, which rose to a hysterical pitch. The years of imprisonment, the moments of torture, 
The sustained humiliation burst out of the mouths of the thirty-five emaciated soldiers and echoed among the foothills of the Manchurian mountains. Major Robert Lamar arrived at the gates of Sion on August 19. While Sergeant Harold Leith remained outside, Lamar entered the Commandant's office. Lieutenant Marui was quite gracious and promptly offered the doctor a cup of tea. When Lamar asked to see the prisoners, Marui said he would have to wait until the next day. The two men began to argue. After a prolonged discussion, the Japanese officer relented and sent for General Wainwright. Several minutes later, the emaciated man appeared. He did not enter. Instead, he waited at the door. He stared at Lamar and whispered, Are you really Americans? Lamar nodded and identified himself. Wainwright waited where he stood until Marui signalled him across the threshold. Then he took a few steps in, stopped again and bowed from the waist to his captor. Major Lamar quickly jumped up and offered the general a chair. Marui shouted, He must remain standing. Wainwright said nothing. Lamar insisted that he be seated. Another argument began. During it, Wainwright stood to one side, listening calmly. Lamar won. Jonathan Wainwright sat down in the presence of his enemy. Lamar turned and said, General, you are no longer a prisoner. You're going back to the States. Wainwright thought a moment, then asked the one question that had plagued him for so many long days and nights. What do the people in the States think of me? His eyes bored into Lamar's as the Major answered, You're considered a hero there. Your picture is even in Time magazine. Wainwright was not convinced. When he went back to his quarters, he was still not sure what awaited him on the outside. Lamar and Leith stayed that night at Sion and had breakfast the following morning with all of the Allied officers stationed there. The OSS men watched as the prisoners carefully counted out each bean for the soup so that no one would be cheated. They were impressed with the general lethargy that dulled the spirits of the men sitting at the table. Lamar made a decision during the morning. Because his radio was out of order, he could not advise Hennessy at Mukden that Wainwright and the others were alive. Fearing that this special group of officers might possibly be used as hostages by Japanese or Russian forces in the area, Lamar left Leith behind and went back to Mukden that day to make arrangements for prompt transportation. There, his plans for quick action were foiled by the entry of Russian troops. When he attempted to round up vehicles to accommodate the prisoners, he was met by indifference on the part of the Soviets, who had begun to drink up all the liquor in Mukden. While Lamar fought his frustrating battle with the Russians, the wait seemed interminable to the prisoners at Sian. Three, four long, restless days passed without American troops appearing on the road from the south. Wainwright and the others moped around, deflated, but at least free to go about the camp as they pleased. Finally, on the morning of August 24, a commotion at the gate announced the arrival of strangers, not Americans, but a thirty-man squad of burly, vigorous Russian soldiers. Their leader, a ferocious-looking bearded lieutenant colonel, walked up to Wainwright and said to him through Leith, who spoke Russian, I am headed for Mukden with my detachment and these jeeps. If you can furnish your own transportation and be ready in an hour, I will take you with me. The colonel wanted no nonsense and brooked no delay by the Americans. He was still at war with Japanese units straggling through the fluid lines in Manchuria. The Americans were only too glad to leave under any circumstances. Wainwright turned to Lieutenant Marui, his Japanese ruler for these many months, and asked that buses be provided for the prisoners. Marui, cowed by the sight of Russian troops cradling machine guns, quickly answered, Yes, sir. Wainwright savoured the reply. It was the first time in years any Japanese had shown him that courtesy. The contingent from Sian headed southwest in the midst of a convoy of American-built jeeps painted with the Red Star of the Soviet Union. The Russians promptly got lost. For almost a full day, the Americans endured the wanderings of the Soviet column as it drove up and down the roads of Manchuria looking for Mukden. Eventually they abandoned the jeeps for a train. When it broke down, they commandeered another one from a Japanese crew. In the meantime, American authorities had become frantic about Wainwright. Search planes scoured the countryside. Rumours circulated that the Russians had kidnapped the general and spirited him back into Siberia. He was alive, but where? At 1.30am on the morning of August 27, a weary group arrived at the railroad yards in Mukden. The trip was over. As his coach car came to a stop, 
Wainwright slumped into an exhausted sleep. Leith went looking for Lamar, who soon came to Wainwright with exciting news. Not only was the general to fly to Chungking that morning, but he had been invited to attend the surrender ceremonies on the Missouri. MacArthur had requested his presence. Wainwright was overjoyed. He waved the cane given to him years before by MacArthur and stepped off the train and away from the past. Nine men walked into a C-47 transport plane in the darkness of pre-dawn China. Lights on the runway at the Kunming airstrip illuminated the parachutes on their backs and the American flags sewn on their left sleeves. They were dressed in green fatigues and wore the jump boots of the paratrooper. The nine men were part of Mission Pigeon, a quick and skillful thrust into the Japanese-held island of Hainan, off the coast of South China. They were yet another OSS detachment intent on bringing relief to Allied prisoners still living in misery behind the enemy lines. There was reason to believe that the Japanese on Hainan, cut off from normal communications with their headquarters, were unaware that the war had been over for 12 days. The men settling down in the C-47 for the long ride to the drop zone expected trouble at the other end. The leader of the team was a wiry 24-year-old blonde from California, Major John Singlaub. He had achieved that rank within the last few hours, and it was only temporary. It had been decided that giving him such status would allow him more leverage in dealing with any Japanese officer who refused to concede that the war was truly over. Singlaub would act as spokesman, and on his actions might depend the fate of the entire group. He had a radio man, Sergeant Tony Deneau, a medic, Corporal James Healy, intelligence officers Charles Walker, John Bradley and Arnold Brakey, an adjutant, Captain Len Woods, and interpreters, Lieutenants Peter Fong and Ralph Yempuku, a short, stocky Nisei from Hawaii. A veteran of OSS campaigns in Thailand and Indochina, here Yempuku had a particularly ticklish job. It would be up to him to communicate quickly with possibly belligerent Japanese, to interpret for both sides, to smooth over any rough spots. None of the men had ever worked together before. They had been called to Kunming from various assignments to fly as a unit onto an enemy island. Singlaub had organised the many details of the mission under great pressure, including a flood at Kunming which had inundated the city. Now the C-47 gained speed down the Kunming runway and took off into the night. Mission Pigeon was airborne. As the team flew southeast, it discussed the strategy to be used in meeting the Japanese. Singlaub knew that the first moments of the confrontation would be crucial to their fate. If the Japanese who saw the OSS men land were inclined to continue the war, Singlaub and his men might be quickly dispatched. It all depended on that initial reaction. In the early light of August 27, the C-47 droned over the South China Sea and came to its landfall, the Bakli Bay section of Hainan. Somewhere near this inlet, there was a prison camp housing remnants of Australian and Dutch armies that had been annihilated by the Japanese over three years ago in Java and other islands of the East Indies. Photographs taken recently showed a cluster of buildings about a mile or so in from the seashore. Without any other positive information, Singlaub could only assume that this compound was the target. As the plane came down toward the island, he ordered the pilot to fly in very low over the terrain in order to pick a suitable landing place. Seeing a fairly clear field, he gave instructions to the men. They would jump from 600 feet and quickly assemble the various supplies being dropped with them. When the Japanese appeared, Singlaub would talk to them through Yempuku. Area and nine men leaped out and floated down under billowing parachutes, followed by medical and food supplies. Yempuku smashed his chin on landing and stood up with blood streaming from it. Captain Len Woods hit his head and was groggy as he reached for his camera to record the unfolding action. The others landed without mishap. Medic Jim Healy put a butterfly bandage on Yempuku's cut. Singlaub looked about and saw in the distance a huge crowd of Chinese civilians, coming over the brow of a hill toward the group. From the other direction, he saw three trucks filled with Japanese troops speeding down a road from the general area of the prison camp. The OSS unit had reached its crisis almost immediately. Affecting unconcern, the nine men went about picking up supplies and gathering them into a pile while the speeding trucks headed straight into the grassy meadow. When the trucks stopped, 
Singlaub turned to face the first man who got out and walked toward him. He was a lieutenant challenging the Americans at once. Who are you? Yempuku repeated the words to Singlaub, who shouted, We have come to help the Allied prisoners now that the war is over. Send your soldiers to the far side of the field to protect my people and equipment from those civilians. Prefacing his speech with, The Major says, Yempuku translated for the Japanese. Obviously confused by Singlaub's abrupt command, the lieutenant hesitated. The two groups stood fifty feet apart, silent, alert and apprehensive. Singlaub and his men wore sidearms but kept their hands away from them. The Japanese troops, far outnumbering the Americans, held their rifles ready and waited for the lieutenant to make a move. The Japanese officer's slow reaction lost him the initiative. Finally he spoke to his men, who quickly moved out across the field toward the Chinese bordering it. He had already committed himself to the Americans, and Singlaub followed up the advantage, saying, Turn them around to face the Chinese. The befuddled lieutenant turned his men and their weapons away from the Americans. Bring a truck over here to help load up the supplies. The truck moved across the field to the supplies. By sheer nerve, Singlaub had won the first round. The Americans sat in the back of a truck as it sped over the hills to a cluster of buildings where 356 soldiers and sailors lived in this August of 1945. The OSS men were taken to a long barracks-like building which served as a mess hall for the Japanese. Their gear and supplies were brought inside and stacked up. At the moment, they were still free men. Singlaub would not discuss anything with the Japanese lieutenant, who appeared to have recovered his poise somewhat. Instead, he insisted on talking to the ranking officer at the camp and told the lieutenant to get in touch with the colonel or general or whoever had authority to treat with the American unit. The Japanese, still compliant, went into the next room to telephone. Ralph Yempuku eavesdropped as he spoke excitedly to the person on the other end. Colonel, they jumped in here in broad daylight. He says the war is over, but they landed here in the middle of the day. Yes, but the Major says the war is over. Yes, sir. The lieutenant came back to his visitors and asked them to be patient. The colonel could not arrive until the next day, and until that time they would be housed in the mess hall. They could also keep their guns. The OSS men went into their new home and got settled. Unobtrusively, a full complement of Japanese troops took up positions around the perimeter of the building. The Japanese, still unsure of whether or not the Americans were telling the truth, had carefully balanced themselves on both sides of the issue. Though still armed, the team was under house arrest, and until the Japanese heard otherwise, the war was officially on. As darkness settled over the compound on Hainan, Major John Singlaub did not know whether his bluff had worked or not. The guards outside were not a reassuring sign, but at least his team was alive. A Chinese cook came to the mess hall to cook dinner for the Americans. At first, surprised and pleased by the friendly gesture, Singlaub and his weary, nervous men then began to consider the possibility of being poisoned. The Japanese could dispose of the bodies and claim that the Americans had met with foul play at the hands of the many bandits who infested the hills of Hainan. The excellent food went down slowly and laboriously as the OSS men watched each other for spasms. None occurred. The last course was as good as the first. 